My name is Bukola Oriola. This is Imprison Show, a show that is dedicated to educate the public about human trafficking. Welcome to the show. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the Educational Institutes, what they are doing about human trafficking on campuses, in schools, and we have found out that there are so many organizations out there doing something about human trafficking through UNESCO, because there is an anti-slavery organization who is working on curriculum for kids from elementary school to learn about human trafficking in the United Kingdom. And it is a fact that children are the most trafficked victims. There are millions of victims being trafficked all around the world, and half of those are children. So there is a strong need to educate even our little children about human trafficking so that they don't only know, but also know how to speak out and also know how to prevent themselves or ourselves in our community. Welcome to the show once again. With us tonight, Marcellus Davies is the director of Diversity and Multiculturalism at the Anoka Ramsey Community College. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invite. I'm wondering, how long have you been in the academic world? Great question. I have been in the uh, academic higher education world for about five years, almost six years now. I originally started at Anoka Technical College, working as a transition advisor that was located at the Champlain Park High School. And I was, um, and currently for the last four years, I've been at Anoka Ramsey Community College as the Director of Diversity and Multiculturalism. And uh, when was the first time you heard about human trafficking? Uh, about two years ago, I have a colleague at the Winona State University, which um, Bakula and um, Linda Miller from civil society, I had recently spoke at Renona State, and he suggested that it may be um, a great awareness, eye-opening experience, an educational experience for Anoka Ramsey students and Anoka Ramsey faculty in the community there um, to hear about what's going on in Minnesota. And at the time, he just gave me a stat that was uh, staggering. Um, he said, um, um, slavery is going on still in this country. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said. Well, Minnesota is um, in the top 10 um, in states in the nation um, for human sex trafficking. I said, come on, man, you're just, you're, just, you're just making some statistics up. He said, no, it's the truth. Um, we truly don't talk about this conversation um, in Minnesota about what's going on in our backyards and what's going on so um, close to our homes um, that you know, we don't pay attention to it. When we think of human sex trafficking, we automatically think what's going on overseas. But the reality is, from the information I've learned from you, um, and the little bit that I've done on my own, is that uh, the United States is the second in the world, as far as countries, for human sex trafficking. And in this great de democratic society, we just don't think that these type of evil things are happening, but they are. And when you decided to introduce this in your college, how did the student react to it? Uh, I think uh, I think that the information was mind-boggling. Again, when you think of Minnesota, you don't think of human sex trafficking. We kind of think of that as a coastal issue, if we're going to think about it in regards to the United States. But again, I think many of our thinkings, or much of our thinking, and as, and I mean as a community, this is something that's happening overseas. This is nothing that's happening in the land of the free, home of the brave. This is something that's a world issue, but not a Minnesota issue. So um, there were some student groups who were very, very interested, and there were a lot of faculty who were interested. And I believe that when we, we presented this the first time, um, we had almost packed houses for your presentation on both campuses as we work in Cambridge as well as we work in Coon Rapids. And how long have you been doing this in the college? Uh, um, 
we, we present a program called Diversity Lecture and Discussion Series, which you were a part of, and we've been doing that for the last three years. And uh, our goal with this particular Diversity and Lecture Discussion Series is to cover a wide range of social justice issues that impact our communities on a daily basis. And um, without an awareness, we can't create a resolution. So we want to start with awareness, and then we ask our speakers to create some um, action um, plans or help begin those action plans for the audience. What can you do now? That was one of the questions that you were bombarded with, with that Linda was bombarded with, was what can we do to help? Mm -hmm. And that's where we want our students, our faculty, our community members to start asking the question, what can I do in my own respective space, in my own life, what can I do to help eradicate some of the injustices that are plaguing our world, plaguing our society, and instead of having the United States or United people have created this dissension and this divisiveness that happens on a daily basis within our communities. And uh, have you had victims coming out by themselves on campus, or have you heard about any students working with victims since you started this program in college? Uh, great question. Um, through our evaluations, we have um, run into um, people who have come out throughout, throughout the evaluations and said that they were a victim. Um, and fortunately for us, through your presentations, um, there's been information for help. We also had a particular person who came out in one of your presentations who stated that she had been a victim of human um, trafficking. And, and she said, you know, this is uh, by the grace of God um, that she came to this presentation because she had no awareness that this was going to even be happening on campus. She saw a flyer as she was researching human sex trafficking in the library and saw this flyer and headed up to the presentation. So it was just so timely. Um, and I think it was not timely in the, the sense that she was in a space that she could learn more about it, but it was timely that she was in a space to where she could get the help that she may have needed at that time. And um, the study of human trafficking at Anoka Ramsey, is it focused on a particular group or particular class of students? Uh, you know, that's a great question. You know, uh, one of the things we do when we do this diversity lecture and discussion series is that we try to look at some of our, um, our, 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 course, our courses and our catalogs, and we try to identify some courses that may, um, you know, have some interest in, in this particular presentation. And you know, right off the bat, psychology. Psychology is a course that we contacted and they were interested. Why? Because not only the psychology of a victim, but there is also a psychology of an oppressor that has to be examined as well. Um, and then not only the psychology of a victim who may be an adult, but as you stated very clearly on, what is the psychology of a child who goes through this and how do they grow up? So th learning about the brain and how it reacts to this. Well, we have a program called Hyper. Well, that's the physical development of the body. Well, what goes on with the physical development of a child who's been through this? Um, and then women's studies, um, social, so uh, sociology courses, uh, capital. So how does the business how do we get the business departments involved? Because this wouldn't be done if there weren't big bucks behind it. So, you know, pretty much every course in our catalog could probably have been um, uh, invited to this particular presentation because, again, this is a problem that's much bigger than one discipline that we offer mm -hmm. in our institution. This, is, uh, this covers the whole breadth of courses we offer. Uh, what do you hope to achieve with the study of human trafficking on campus? Well, you know, um, I believe in social activism. So um, to create the awareness, because without awareness, it's going to be hard to have action. So create the awareness from um, students. It doesn't even matter if it's one or a thousand to get invested, to understand how we are all interconnected, um, what affects you affects me. Um, and um, I have been able to work with you for the past couple of years, and, and your hurt becomes my hurt. 
So to get our students aware, to get our faculty, to get our community aware of what's going on in their communities, our communities, and how can we collectively help to eradicate this at whatever level. If it's signing a petition, if it's just learning about it and, and learning signs and someone making a call if they see something that's suspicious. What can we do in our daily lives to eradicate this, um, this hate? Because that's what it is. You, must have, you have to hate a human to do what you're doing to other humans in this capacity. And what has been the challenge you have faced in making this ongoing on campus? It's, it's a great question. You know, um, with doing so many lectures a year, and inviting um, and, and covering so many topics. We don't get to, to stay on one topic. So some of these topics deserve multiple lectures. And when you're able to just do one and then you gotta, you're going on to another one, you may lose a crowd okay. that you've got. And to be able to um, hands-on work with all the people who are interested in it. Uh, we're at a community college, and the reality is, is that people come to school, they got to go to work, they got a family. Okay. Um, so just being able to stay in touch and stay tight knit with this good energy to do something and get it done, that, that becomes a challenge. And that's the part of working on a college campus; it becomes challenging. But uh, we're making we're, we're making great gains. We just created an Amnesty International um, student organization on our campus. Um, uh, who was a part of bringing you on campus last year. So, you know, this, the energy, it's moving. Okay. It's, it's not where we can go, but we're moving towards that. Okay. And um, some organizations have recommended having human trafficking studies at every level of education. And in fact, they have been able to make some kind of curriculum for these in other parts of the world. For example, in UK, something is on right now. And then in Africa, in some countries in Africa, um, the same thing is going on where even elementary children are being taught the topic of human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So do you agree that there, is a, there should be a curriculum for the study of human trafficking, just like every other subject? Uh, I would agree. And, you know, one thing I always get cautious of is that um, this particular conversation gets um, just masked in women's studies as if it's just a women's issue. I caution that because this is a human issue. Um, now, if women's studies is the, the venue where we can get this particular course in, well, we got to roll with it because um, opportunities don't always present themselves. So every opportunity that we have, we have to take it. Um, but this is a humanity issue. And again, this is a course that can be um, taught in multiple disciplines, in my opinion. Um, and we take it how we get it. We also have a book club. It's called Multicultural Perspectives Book Series. Um, you have written a book. And to be able to introduce it there is a way to get it into the curriculum to where we can read, we can have discussion, we can have dialogue. And we're also fortunate that we have you as a natural precious research or resource in our community that you may be able to come in and give us clarity on some particular topics in the book that we may not have understand. So any way we can get it, we got to get it. We just got to move towards trying to get it. And it is the education that comes with human sex trafficking. OK. and. Um would you say it's okay to study it at even the elementary school? I think there's a way that we can introduce it at the elementary school. And I think the elementary school is a broad conversation because you do have K through five. How mm -hmm. would you present it to a kindergarten? Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer to that. But I do understand how we possibly could present it to a fifth grader, a sixth grader. How do you get to the humanity of conversation? Our children understand that. Our children understand what's good and what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And this is clearly wrong. How do we present that in a language that they can speak? And also, uh, right now, too, there is this... So, we are 10th. I think we're 
11th or 12th actually now. Has, have you heard a lot about it in Minnesota? I had never. I'm 34 years old. And if I'm just hearing about human sex trafficking, we're not getting the information. I can't always listen to NPR. Sorry. And so there has to be other ways for me to get this information. And the school is a place where we spend a lot of time of study. So it makes sense. On the last note, what would be your recommendation? In regards to? To the American society. In regards um, to educating the Americans about human trafficking and making everybody involved at every level. Um, open our ears, our hearts, and our minds to um, really acknowledging these stories. Um, you know, not just uh, hearing them, but truly listening to them and hearing them that they're really happening in our communities. Um, because they are, they're happening in our backyards, they're, they're happening in our neighborhoods. Um, you know, 10 through 12, then the nation speaks for itself. We have a serious issue here. There's 50 plus states, we're 10th or 12th in the nation for human sex trafficking. We got to wake up, and we got to do it now. Um, you know, our children are being kidnapped. Um, our adults are being violated. Um, the chances of us being one degree away or one degree of separation from someone who's been human sex trafficked are pretty high. Um, we have to wake up. We have to coalesce, and that means create action towards eradication of this heinous act, this crime. And I feel that Anoka Ramsey Community College is an epicenter of education information for the community, and we are doing our part by providing these educational um, forums to deepen your understanding, our understanding as a community as we move forward to eradicate it. Utilizing our local human rights commission, um, because this is a human rights issue, um, is one avenue, um, and it's not all the onus on the human rights commission, to create these forums for a conversation about something that's plaguing Anoka County as well as it's plaguing the state of Minnesota. Anoka Ramsey Community College uh, should be held accountable for creating these forums for educational deepening and awareness. Um, Anoka Hennepin School District should have forums that educate about this um, because this is truly an, a, a community issue and every community outlet that we have for deepening our understanding should be exhausted um, whether it's um, conversing with the sheriff department whether it's conversing with the um, someone at the government building the community players, the community stakeholders, the community leaders have to speak because they have a platform to do it about what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, it's not to point fingers at. This is to get the awareness out so we can do the work that needs to be done to eradicate what's going on in regards. Someone in Noka, some bodies have been in Noka, or in Noka have been affected by uh, human sex trafficking. Um, there's a reality that there may be um, an oppressor, an offender in Anoka Ramsey mm -hmm. community, in, in, in Anoka uh, County. Um, what are signs that we need to be aware of as community members um, that's most pertinent information so that this can stop? Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for coming today. We really mm -hmm. appreciate you coming no here. No problem. Thank you for the invite. Um, it's been a great time. and. Um, you know, once we turn off these uh, video cameras, the work still has to continue. So I'm looking forward to continuing the work. Thank you. Advocate Excellence Award segment. And today, an advocate has been nominated. Her name is Zoa Jean. Zoa John works with Community Passage 
It's a program for all kinds of victims of crime in terms of providing housing for them because someone who has been enslaved and suffered all kinds of torture or abuse needs to move on and needs a shelter to live in. So Sips Simpson Housing provides this shelter through the community passage by providing a two housing scheme, sorry, a two year housing scheme for survivors. And um, the survivor who nominated her said, Zoa deserves the Advocate Excellence Award because she went out of her way to make me and my daughter feel at home when we were at Passage Community Program of Simpson Family Housing. Through her, I got to know about all the resources that I needed throughout the duration of the program. And Zoa has been working with this organization for the past three years. According to her, she had served um, different kinds of families, including women and children, to give them a better life and a new life to be free again and move on with their lives. So we are really grateful to you, Zoa. We are happy to present you this award. We hope that this will encourage you to work harder and um, do more at your job. We know it's a lot of work, but we hope that this will give you a lot of encouragement. We appreciate you here. We love you and God bless you. With the information that some sex acts and happy endings may occur behind closed doors. But Representative Frank Wolf from Vienna, Virginia stopped by the other day to remind us that the giggles may be inappropriate. That something much more serious goes on behind these closed doors. The parlors help facilitate human sex trafficking of young women mostly Korean, who come to this country expecting to start a new life and instead spend years in virtual slavery, trying to work off massive debt incurred by the supposed cost of immigrating here. Wolf asked the Polaris Project, a nationally known anti-human trafficking organization, to look into the Northern Virginia's many Asian massage parlors. By scanning the internet, many websites and bulletin boards are offering more than just legal massage. The parlors are run by well-organized businessmen who navigate the maze of licensing and zoning requirements to maintain storefronts. Wolf recently sent letters to the U.S. Attorney in Alexandria and the Director of the FBI imploring them to take more action. A Dorchester, Massachusetts man already charged with kidnapping a 15-year-old Dorchester High School student and forcing her into prostitution in Boston area motels now faces charges that he used a 16-year-old girl for the same purposes. He's charged with 10 counts of deriving support from a minor in prostitution, seven counts of aiding and abetting the commissioner of statutory rape, four counts of statutory rape, four counts of visual material of a child in a state of nudity, and three counts of posing or exhibiting a child in the state of nudity. He was arrested outside a Best Western after he left a 15-year-old girl alone briefly and she used the time to go down to the lobby and contact her aunt online. This case makes plain that prostitution is not a victimless crime. Cases like this don't reflect agreements between consenting adults. They show the true form of human trafficking in Massachusetts. Indiana Attorney General Greg Zoller says he hopes to spearhead an effort to crack down on human trafficking ahead of the 2012 Super Bowl in Indianapolis. He said the recent track record of America's most watched sporting events suggests that along with it comes an uptick in women, especially those under the age of 18, who are brought into the United States illegally and forced into prostitution. He said because of a loophole in current state statutes, the organized exploitation of children by people who profit from the sale of sex with minors is not a crime. Our goal is to increase awareness that prostitution isn't a victimless crime, Zoller said. Many of these young women who enter the sex trade are often physically forced, coerced, raped, or imprisoned by their traffickers. In international news, two Guatemalan sisters are arrested in Mexico on human trafficking and labor exploitation charges, prosecutors said. The women found different minors in Guatemala who they made believe would find work in Mexico. The victims were then separated from their families and taken to Ciudad del Carmen, a city in Campache State. 
and were made to engage in forced work, including cleaning automobile windshields, selling flowers, and juggling in the streets. Without rest and without receiving payment of any kind, and were watched constantly and put under physical threat and violence of being jailed. Parents have called on state and federal authorities to do more to crack down on brothels linked to sex trafficking. Three suspected human traffickers have been arrested who are believed to have been have forced seven Indonesian women into the sex trade in Malaysia. The syndicate found its victims with various methods. According to police, the women had responded to ads placed in the newspaper by the syndicate that promised salaries as high as $900 a month as migrant workers. The victims were smuggled on the border into Kuching, Malaysia. The three women were then pressed into services as sex workers at the pub president KTV in Kuching. That's all for the news today. Back to you, Bukola. in honor of victims who have lost their lives as a result of human trafficking and we hope that their soul rests in perfect peace. They have a lot of opportunity. They can go to the area malls, they can go to skate parks, they can uh, hit the bus stops or other parks. And in this modern day that we live in, social media is a huge um, um, area where they also go and look for, for more victims, whether it's on Facebook or some other uh, area like that. And the, the youth don't always realize, in the case of youth, but people in general even, don't always realize that 
the person they're talking to or communicating with and establishing a friendship really isn't a friendship and more often than not uh, you know it's very routine when they get to a place like the United States they don't even know that they can call the police or the police is their friend they can open up to the police do you have a word for this kind of people to be able to open up more I I do um, the police here in America certainly in Anoka County uh, are fine respectable caring individuals and if they come across information uh, that an individual is being trafficked I can almost guarantee they will pass that information along um, they at that point certainly will not make judgments about people. They will want to get that information and get it passed along to the, to the prosecutor, to the sheriff's office, to whomever can uh, step in and uh, begin to make a difference. So I would tell your watchers and your listeners to this program that if you are in a situation where you feel uh, you are being trafficked, either sex or labor, uh, there are hotlines to call, uh, there are police departments wherever you are living or the sheriff's office and make sure uh, that you tell them that indeed you have been kept against your will and forced to do these things and you are ready to break free of that and you need to break free and you need their help and most police officers I've ever encountered when asked for help will respond isn't that correct sheriff absolutely correct I can tell your, your listeners about some hotline numbers okay. if you'd like Still? me to. Yes. Uh, there is a, a hotline. It's a 1-800. It's 1-888-373-7888. I will repeat that. 1-888-373-7888. And that is a toll-free number. And if you feel you are in a situation where you are being trafficked, either for labor or sex, please pick up the phone and call that hotline. That hotline is answered 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So people will be there to get the information to you. If you have access to a computer, there are a couple of websites. There are many websites. Thank you for staying with us throughout the show today. We really appreciate your staying with us because without you, we can't have the show. And we want to encourage you, if you're a victim or a survivor, please nominate your advocates for the Advocates Excellence Award. If you have new tips or ideas, please send us an email. Our contact is info at imprisonshow.com. And um, if you have an event and you want us to be there, please send us an email. If you know someone or a group doing something about human trafficking, anywhere in the world, we are willing to be a part of it. Please contact us and we'll be willing to work with you and show the world what we are doing about human trafficking because we all know that human trafficking affects every one of us, including children, women, men, boys, and girls. So it's not just a women issue. Men are also affected. Boys are affected just like girls because remember, 50% of victims are children. So we want you to continue to stay with us. We'll see you next time. We thank you throughout this time. And, uh, <laughs>